Well, I have to tell you that uh, if you'd have told me 30 years when I was sitting where some of you are right now that I would come back and be standing here as a professor, I would have said, you're crazy. Um, but God has a funny way of doing those things, and it is really wonderful to be back, and I want to express my sincerest thanks to the search committee and the administration and all the people that were responsible for calling me to, uh, to this very exciting position. I'm really looking forward to getting to know all of you and seeing how we can uh, do some things with the Mockler Center that will hopefully expand its footprint a little bit and get people to understand the heresy of the Sunday-Monday divide. Now, I don't want to sound paranoid, um, but I'm actually the only one of the three new professors who had to read that <laughs> statement. Uh, and furthermore, I had to follow Dr. Price in chapel, so if I come off as a little paranoid, I have reason to be paranoid. You know what they say, just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they're not out to get you. So I decided today I wanted to talk a little bit about the election. And, and the reason why I wanted to speak about the election is a few things. First of all, because uh, frankly, what I do, the intersection of economics and theology and faith and work is by nature political. You cannot avoid that. And the fact of the matter is, the election is still the elephant in the room wherever you go. So I thought it might be helpful to, to give one person's perspective on that election, which might be a little bit different because of the fact that I've been living abroad for almost all of my, well, the majority of my adult life, as have some other people in this room. But before I do that, I want to make one thing explicitly clear, and I, and I mean this sincerely uh, with all of my heart. It's a warning to those of you who will someday uh, be pastors of churches and have the privilege of the pulpit. And that is this. The pulpit of Jesus Christ is never to be used as a bully pulpit for partisan politics. If you remember nothing else I say today, please remember that. It is never to be used for that purpose. And a lot of well-meaning pastors make that mistake because they believe in their hearts that they're right. But I can assure you Neither presidential candidate and neither political party has a monopoly on virtue. That I can promise you. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we cannot or we should not or we dare not wander into the world of politics and issues that affect society. In fact, that is something we must do. And as Dr. Price so eloquently pointed out yesterday, one of the things we are called to do as Christians is speak truth to power. And so it is in that context, not the politics as we understand it in a partisan way, but politics in the way we understand our relationship to the public square that I would like to speak to the election. Now, this presidential election was the first time in 20 years that I was here for the entire election cycle and actually got to cast my vote on election day. And boy, did I pick a lousy year to come back. <laughs> it's not an exaggeration to say that on more than one occasion, my wife gave me the evil eye and said, why did you bring us back now? Um, it was a weird election. I think we can all agree with that. It, it, at times, it felt to me like a circus. Um, I was really really disturbed by so much of the discourse and the rhetoric. And you have to imagine what it's like. All my friends in England were emailing me constantly saying, please explain, <laughs> to which I would have to reply, no explanation possible. <laughs> there is no apologetic for the last election. Um, and of course, the result was historic in many ways, uh, not since the stolen election of 1876, uh, have we had a situation where the losing candidate um, took nearly 2% more votes than the winning candidate. That doesn't mean we should get rid of the Electoral College, by the way. The Electoral College is genius because it's one of the ways in which we protect the integrity of the small states from being run roughshod over the large states. But there is something about it that just seems unnatural to our democratic instincts. So it was an historic election in that way. And also the fact that we had um, a non-politician who uh, ran for president and broke all of the rules and won, 
uh, made it another very curious election. And uh, he also wore the mantle of business person, which makes it a very personal thing for me that uh, this person wore that mantle and ran the election in the way that he did. Now, I understand that if the statistics are correct, a lot of people in this room are very happy with the result. And praise God. You know, we, we have a process and we elect a president and then we are obligated as part of our social contract to support the person who won. And I really want to thank uh, Dr. Hollinger for, for putting his name to a letter uh, of religious leaders that said we must do exactly that. Now, some of us, on the other hand, weren't as thrilled by the result. And I'm going to, for the purpose of full disclosure, tell you that I'm one of those people. Um, I was not happy with the result. But I obviously accept the result. And I don't know about you, but I prayed this morning for the president-elect. I hope you are all praying for the president-elect. But while we support the president-elect, it doesn't mean, again, that we shouldn't speak truth to power, especially now that the election is over. We can't be accused of being partisan. Now we're talking about speaking truth to power. But the first thing I want to say is on a pastoral level, especially for some of you who are younger here. Um, I know a lot of you are depressed about the election result, and you think things are really bad. Well, because I am slightly longer in the tooth, I can promise you things are not as bad as they seem. Uh, and this too shall pass. Because you see, I remember vividly the 1960s. In fact, one of the first memories I have as a human being is my mother staring out the window of our home with a blank look on her face, the likes of which I had never seen before during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I said to her, remember, I was a small boy. I said, Mommy, what's wrong? And she didn't even look at me. She just continued to stare out the window, and she said, we drop a bomb on them, they drop a bomb on us, and it's over. And then she snapped out of it and realized she was talking to a five-year-old boy. And she felt terrible that she had done that. But she was so entranced by the probability of nuclear annihilation that she had forgotten where she was, who she was. And that, my friends, was a fear we lived with growing up in this country during the Cold War every single day. Another memory as a young boy was the assassination of our president. Again, I was about six years old, and my brother, who had just gotten married, burst into our home. We all went to greet him because he had just come back from his honeymoon, and without another word being uttered, he threw his hands open and he said, they've just shot the president. And then we spent three days in front of our television. We didn't eat a cooked meal for three days. A lot of you probably went through the same thing. We were, we were mortified that in America we would assassinate our president. And I remember distinctly April 1968 when we assassinated Martin Luther King. And in June of 1968 when we assassinated Robert Kennedy, a candidate for president. And I remember the civil rights struggle. I remember turning on the TV and seeing people chased with dogs and hoses and sticks and thinking, this can't be happening in this country. It happened, folks, in this country. You think we're divided now. Ask somebody who lived in the 60s what being divided really means. And I remember the 1970s. I remember the anti-war movements. I remember the 1972 convention where there were riots on the floor of the convention. I remember the two great recessions of the 1970s. And I remember the OPEC oil crisis when we had to wait in line for two hours to get a, a gallon of gas. Believe me, things have been much worse in this country. So don't be in despair over the result of one election. And I also remember July 1976. Because in July 1976, I was 19 years old. 
And as Rick alluded to, I studied politics. And if truth be told, I was actually a political prodigy at 19. I was actually on the floor of Madison Square Garden the day Jimmy Carter accepted the nomination for president of the Democratic Party nomination in 1976. Now, you can imagine what that felt like after going through all of the civil rights protests, the anti-war protests, Watergate, the most divisive time imaginable, Watergate. And I'm standing in this convention and I, I'm looking at this outsider who was going to come to Washington. And what was he going to do? Drain the swamp. <laughs> he was going to drain the swamp. And he was a born-again Christian. And I remember thinking, wow, this is really going to make things better. Well, things didn't exactly turn out <laughs> the way we had hoped. Um, but then, four years later, another outsider came riding into Washington on a horse with a Stetson hat and Hollywood good looks. He came right out of central casting, in fact. And this Washington outsider was going to drain the swamp. And guess what his campaign slogan was? That was Ronald Reagan's campaign slogan in 1980. And I bet a lot of you didn't know that or remember that. And by the way, his opponent's slogan was strength in unity. Now, do those two slogans sound anything similar? <laughs> you, think they, you think the Democrats would have learned if you respond to make America great with strength and unity or we're stronger together, it might not work. But guess what? That didn't have the desired effect either. For the next 36 years, we had Democratic presidents, we had Republican presidents, we had insiders, we had outsiders. We had times of war, we had times of peace. We had times of economic boom, and we had times of economic bust, and it happened on both parties' watches. Okay? So it didn't have the desired result. But I have to tell you, in the spirit of tr speaking truth to power, I have to tell you, I hate this slogan. I hate this slogan. And here's why I hate the slogan. First of all, I hate it because it is the most jingoistic, self-aggrandizing, arrogant statement I've ever encountered in the public square. And as someone, as I said, who spent most of his adult life living abroad, it doesn't gain us any friends abroad, I can promise you that. That's the first reason I don't like it. Second reason I don't like it is I don't know what it means. Could someone please tell me what that means? By what metric are we supposed to determine whether or not America is quote unquote great? By what metric? By the size of our military? Well, we certainly have the biggest. We also spend more on our military budget than the rest of the world combined. Does that make us great? I don't know. I kind of don't think so. Is it economics? We have the largest economy in the world by a mile, larger than the next five economies combined. But we also have a debt of 130% of our GDP. Does that make us great? I don't know. The point is, I'm not so sure we're even supposed to desire being great. What, what is the benefit of being great? Where in the Bible does it say that we should try to be great as a nation? Well, I think there is one possible metric for measuring greatness as a nation. Alexis de Tocqueville famously wrote a book in the 19th century. He was a French philosopher, and he toured America. The title of the book was called American Democracy, or Democracy in America, depending how you translate the French. And in it, many of you have probably heard this statement. America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. How many people have heard that 
Both parties claim it. Both parties use it. But you know what they never do? They never read the entire quote. Here is the entire quote. He says this. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. No one ever talks about that first part of the quotation. And yet, for our purposes, I think it's the most important part of the quotation because it means that we have a moral responsibility to preach that righteousness. And you know what? According to our readings today, the Bible says the same thing. Going back to Genesis 18, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him so that, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord doing righteousness and justice. So you see, while I can't get my head around this, I can get my head around this. This is my new slogan. This is my new slogan. Make America good again. Stop concentrating on the ends and concentrate on the means. If we do the right things, we will get the right results. Anytime I've ever seen anyone try to produce a particular result by manipulating the means, they never get the results they really wanted. That's why I have to tell you that, um, you know, I, I, uh, I stand with Bonhoeffer. When Bonhoeffer says, God hates a visionary leader. Because the visionary leader is always looking at the result and forgetting about the means. And no one understood it better than Bonhoeffer. The dangers of that. So the Bible gives us another metric by which we can measure our goodness. And this is it from Galatians. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And after reading that, I realized that's why I was so upset by this election cycle. Because I didn't see evidence of the fruits of the Spirit. Where was the love? Where was the love? Did either side ever mention love? And by the way, this isn't unique to the American system. I, I had the opportunity to ask a question of the, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, who, as you know, sits in the House of Lords, so he's part of the government. And he had given a talk about human dignity and rights and care, and he used just about every other word but love. And afterwards, I challenged him on it. I said, Archbishop, why... Don't you use the word love? And there was a long pause. And he said, well, because we don't want to come across as sentimental. I thought, we don't want to come across as sentimental. That's not what love is. The Bible tells us what love is. I did two weddings for two of my kids this year, and I read 1 Corinthians 13 both times. It tells us what love is, right? Love is patient. Where was the patience in the discourse during this political season? There was no talk of patience. Everybody in this country wants everything and they want it now. There was no talk of patience. If we are the guardians of these virtues from the Bible, we need to be out there 
telling our politicians and telling each other that patience is a virtue and it's part and parcel with love. And love is kind. And I've come to the conclusion over the years that kindness is more than just the absence of malice. Kindness is when you go out of your way to demonstrate to somebody their worth as a human being created in the image of God. That is kindness. Where was the kindness? I didn't see a lot of kindness. I didn't hear a lot of kindness. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't boast. I mean, the, the description the Bible gives us is so contrary to what we experienced that I really think the church has got to step up and say, wait a minute. We are going to speak the truth to power. We want love to be at the top of the political agenda. And we aren't going to be satisfied until we have love at the top of the political agenda. And joy. There's nothing worse than dour Christians, i got to tell you. Oh, man. Dour, dour Christians. We have so much to be joyful for. Did you see any joy at all? During this election, even during the, even during the uh, conventions, you know, when, when the balloons came down, you know, at the Democratic convention, Bill Clinton looked like he had never seen a balloon before. He was like, oh, and there was a smile on his face. We need to ensure that joy gets back to the top of the agenda, folks. Because if not, we're going to do exactly what the apostle warns us against. We're going to start attacking each other and devouring each other. And peace. I didn't hear one mention of peace during the entire election. We are supposed to be ensigns of the gospel of the Prince of Peace. We need to insist that peace is at the top of the agenda. I heard a lot of people talk about defense. I heard a lot of people talk about war. I heard a lot of people talk about terrorism. I heard a lot of people talking about those things, both sides. I didn't hear anything on anyone's agenda about a country which is the leader of peace in the world other than peace through strength which to me is about as ambiguous as make America great again what does that mean what does that mean goodness folks it's about goodness love joy peace patience kindness goodness and faithfulness. Here's the thing about faithfulness. I learned a long time ago that the opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is fear. And I believe one of the reasons why we've had the kind of election season we've had is because America is a country afraid of its own shadow. We're a nation that lives in fear. And you know why we're a nation that lives in fear? Because we're a nation without faith. So my challenge to you is to reclaim that faith. Have faith in yourselves. Have faith in your neighbors. Have faith in the Constitution. Have faith in the institutions of this country. But most of all, have faith in the Word of God and have faith in God through Christ. For through him, we can conquer anything. We can achieve anything. So, for me, the question is not, are we going to make America great again? The question to the church is, do we have the courage and the faithfulness to make America good again? Because frankly, the church doesn't do it, nobody else is.